Hello friends and welcome to a new episode of the Just Another Mindset podcast, the show that inspires you to change and live a more exciting life. My name is Ishmael and each week I bring to you a relevant conversation, message or topic that will not only entertain you, but help you to change towards a more meaningful and satisfying life, individually and collectively. Let us get inspired and embrace collective changes for the better. Today I have the great joy to share the conversation that I had with Anastasia Vlasova with you. In this episode, you will learn about digital wellness and how to use technology to supplement your life instead of being taken away from it. Anastasia herself went through building a massive growing on Instagram, becoming addicted to social comparison and developing a heavy eating disorder. Today, she shares how her life has changed for the better after deleting social media and stopping social comparison for good. We discuss the power of self-reflection and living a curated life. We talk about benefits of limiting your daily intake of news and why there is an infinite number of supply of opportunity. We elaborate on why design and mental health are so closely connected. We detail physical, digital and mental environments and discuss how to create such for a better functioning society. Finally, we exchange ideas on experimenting on yourself and your lifestyle and we discuss the metaverse. I can say that I really enjoyed the conversation and the topics discussed and I hope that all of you take value from it as well and that all of you have fun listening to this episode. With that, Anastasia, a warm welcome to the Just Another Mindset podcast. And today's episode, I actually want to start with something that I would call to give a little bit of context and to also acknowledge you really for what you've done so far and for what you are doing. The research for this episode has been good fun and you have done a lot of work and you are still doing a lot of great and important work talking about your growing a uh, massive following on Instagram, your social media addiction, your eating disorder, and also the negative effects of Instagram and social comparison really on mental health and young people. And for my understanding today, you're not using any social media, but LinkedIn, and you are the host of our turn to talk podcast with the vision to eventually one day live in a world where we don't have to call it brave to talk openly about mental illness. And just for our audience, I want to give a little bit of context that today we decided not to talk so much about the history of things and your story too much, but that we want to focus really on current and future topics and projects that you are excited about. And I still want to acknowledge you for all the good stuff that you have been doing over the past years. And I'm very, very flattered that you're here on the Just Another Mindset podcast. And with that, Anastasia, one more time. Welcome. And yeah, how do you feel today? What's on your mind? Oh my God. First of all, are you kidding me? I'm flattered that you're even having me on the podcast. <laughs> I was just listening to Dr. Tracy's episode with you uh, the other day and I loved it. And I got even more excited to be on the on the show today, but I'm feeling pretty well. I actually woke up feeling a little bit anxious and overwhelmed because I'm applying to a bunch of internships for this upcoming fall. And that process can be a bit hectic, but went to my workout class and now I feel much more calm and clear headed. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, sports can calm one down, especially before such conversations, recordings and so forth. Wonderful. And my first topic that I would like to discuss a little bit with you is digital well-being. And one could also say digital minimalism, but maybe we start with digital well-being. Anastasia, what does that mean to you for people who don't know the term? What is digital well-being? Yeah, so digital well-being or digital wellness, as I call it, to me means using technology to supplement your life rather than to take away from it. 
And so I think a lot of times we get caught up in the addictive nature of technology, specifically social media, and it ends up taking away from the present moment, from in real life activities. And so I think that digital well being means as I said before, using technology to supplement your life and add value to it and help you out, but not take too much time away from engaging in in real life fulfilling activities. Would you have some examples of digital wellness activities or activities that you do not pursue anymore online? Yeah, I mean, honestly, anything that involves engaging with people or things in real life off of screens, especially when there's no real reason to be on a screen, right? I mean, I go, I go to university and obviously we do a lot of research and writing papers. And so for those tasks, most of my work is done on a computer, but say if I'm walking through a park or hanging out at a cafe with a friend, you'll rarely find me picking up my phone to check text messages or go on social media. I mean, I don't have social media anymore, but if I did, I wouldn't be checking it because I want to enjoy the present moment with that person or in that place or looking at that certain thing because those moments are fleeting. And I think it's important to enjoy the real world as it is because there's so much going on and there's so much stimulation. There's no need to further further add to the to the mess and the chaos of things by um, introducing a phone to like every single activity that you're doing. Mm. And since when, since how long are you, I would just call it more cautious about using your phone about digital wellness and being more present, one may even call it? Yeah. So I started doing these things I call digital detoxes in high school when I still had Instagram and a little bit of a backstory as to my Instagram usage. So I had this fitness and tennis Instagram account that I started in middle school because I was playing a lot of tennis at the time and I was really getting into healthy cooking and eating and just exercising. And I wanted to create a blog to reflect all of that. And so I started sharing that part of my life publicly through Instagram. And it turned into a bit of a part-time job at the time. And I was constantly on Instagram, creating content, managing content schedules, uploading captions, engaging with audience people and all of that. And I just became really overwhelmed and increasingly anxious being on the app so much on a daily basis. And so I decided to do these digital detoxes where I would take about a week or two every month or every two months where I would delete the app. Uh, from my phone and not access it on my computer and just see what it did to my overall mental health and uh, productivity levels and focus levels. And that basically escalated into me just permanently deleting it in May of last year. And by it, I mean Instagram, because that's really like the only social media I had at the time. And I just, the first month was a little bit tough. And I kept thinking, oh, maybe I should go back. Maybe I should uh, keep myself updated on like all of these people's lives. And also there's a lot of creative uh, inspiration on Instagram too. A lot of photographers or travel bloggers or young entrepreneurs that I follow to gain inspiration from. But eventually I decided that there are way too many cons and the cons frankly outweigh the pros of having Instagram on a daily basis um, or even weekly basis. I just find myself a lot more clear headed and focused on my own goals and way less anxious. And so that basically carried on and on for months and months until I was like, okay, I'm never going back to Instagram because there's simply no point. My life feels a lot more mindful right now. And I want to keep it that way. And I'm just assuming, Anastasia, that you spend quite a bit of time on Instagram to yeah, manage all that different engagement work, uploading and so forth. So what is it that you do with that one time nowadays hmm. so basically what I replaced all of that time with mm -hmm. I so that's that's an interesting question because I think about my schedule nowadays and I'm honestly in shock that I was even to able to spend so much time on social media in the past because I'm like how did I find the hours to do that how do I even find the 30 minutes to do that because nowadays my time is mainly consumed. I mean, right now I'm on summer break, so it's a little bit different, but typically during the school year, you know, I live in New York city. There's so there's an abundance of activities to, to do. And so typically my days are filled by 
going to class, doing schoolwork, uh, going to meetings. And especially this past year, I was working on my own uh, youth focused mental health startup. And so a lot of my free time was spent having meetings with advisors or people who could help me build out my venture. I was a participant in the NYU Female Founder Circle, doing the NYU Startup Sprint, doing the NYU Startup Boot Camp, also leading um, one of NYU's student-run venture clubs as well. And so a lot of my free time was taken up by these extracurriculars and working on passion projects, such as that youth-focused mental health startup. And then in addition to that, I love staying physically active. And so a lot of my free time was also devoted to going to the gym, going to yoga class, trying a bar class, running. I joined a running club this past semester, and that was really fun. And I was talking to my mom about this actually the other day. It's a little bit of a side note, but I realized that joining a running club is so great, especially for someone who like loves, who has a busy schedule and loves to do a bunch of things at once kind of, because you get your creative stimulation from running around the city and looking at the architecture and the people and the landscapes. And then you also get to socialize because you're running with a group of people and you're not having headphones in or anything. You're actually having conversations. And then you also, of course, improve your running ability because, oh my God, does it take endurance <laughs> to talk while you're running like six miles? So yeah, just a lot of a lot of that. And also making art. I've devoted a lot more time since deleting uh, social media to working on my illustrations drawing and learning about art too has been a huge part have been a huge part of my life since I was very little my grandma was an artist and I lived with her primarily when I was still in Russia when I was little and I just think it's so important to dedicate time to evolve yourself like culturally and artistically because again it adds a lot of fulfillment um to your life and just makes life more fun and creative and I like <laughs> I like me I like having fun and being creative so no, absolutely. Absolutely. So what I hear is that leaving social media for good or leaving Instagram for good had a tremendous effect on your mental health, on your creativity, and did it also do something to your confidence? I think so, because especially after not having it for a while, like I would say at the two month, three month mark, I started to notice that I didn't really care what other people were up to. You know, like I think whether I wanted to admit it or not, when I had Instagram, especially checking it on a basically hourly basis every day, I was constantly looking at other people's lives and what they were doing. And it wasn't even so much about the physical body comparisons. It was more so like the lifestyle and the work ethic comparisons. Because I, as I said before, I used Instagram as the source of inspiration for, for art and for business and entrepreneurship and all of that. I would compare my quote unquote success or like productivity levels to those people that I followed on Instagram. And that was really unhealthy because it ultimately distracted me from my personal goals. And most of my thoughts were consumed by what other people were doing and how I wasn't doing as much as they were doing rather than actually sitting down and getting tasks done and working towards my goal, you know? And so I think by deleting Instagram, I eliminated a lot of those distracting thoughts which made room for me to sit down and think what venture do I want to work on how can I make it happen how do I get connected to the people who can help me make this happen and slowly but surely I started to dedicate hours hours every single day to that type of work and eventually it resulted in me building my own projects and that again was way more rewarding than just comparing myself constantly to other people no, absolutely. So it sounds like you got rid of a lot of noise, as some would call it, especially digital noise and distraction. And you've been mentioning your personal goals now already two times. I don't know if you want to, but if you feel comfortable talking about those, maybe you can tell us a little bit. Yeah, Anastasia, what is your personal goals at the moment? What are you working on? What are you passionate about? Oh God, that's a loaded question because I feel like I always have 50 personal goals, which is actually, I guess, a goal in and of itself, is, which is to prioritize which goals I want to focus on because I think I'm someone who I love learning. Like I absolutely love learning about every little thing. Um, and so I think the school that I go to is very fitting for that because so at NYU, I go to Gallatin, which is where you can create your own major. Um, and so you're literally free to choose from anything you want and you can like study a combination of things. And that's really liberating for someone like me, but also can be challenging because I have to focus on, you know, at least a couple of things to really like learn them in depth. Um, 
but yeah so and and also again there's like so much context that I feel like I need to say for this because the summer has been a bit of a transition period for me so I mentioned that I was working on that uh, mental health startup this whole past year and I completed the NYU startup sprint and was thinking that I would continue working on this business um, and actually like launch it into the public in the coming months but then I decided that I the model that was being taught at the school, I don't think quite fit with the vision of the company that I had. And so I wanted to take a step back and kind of reevaluate what it is that I want to dedicate the next few years of my life to. And I realized that, you know, right now, because I'm 19, I'm still at school, there's so much for me to learn um, and evolve into. And I just don't know if I want to actually, I know that I don't want to commit myself to building one venture for the next few years of my life, because it's really time consuming. And uh, which is obvious, but like, I I thought that I wanted to de dedicate that much time to it at, in in the past year. But as I, I don't know, grew up and entered summer, I realized that I want to have a bit more of a work-life balance. And I want to take care of my mental health and make sure that the professional work I do is still prioritizing my own well-being. Because the only way that I can create good work and build a solid business and be a good um, like employer and also team member and student is if I feel mentally well and if I feel energized and in order for me to feel that way I need to sleep enough every night I need to eat well I need to exercise I need to make time um, for social interactions and doing things that are creatively stimulating and I just it's really tough to make time for all of that when you're trying to build a startup because a startup is very time consuming and so I decided to put that on pause um, and still and, and, and go through a bit of a career pivot. And so right now, I, I think I mentioned earlier, too, that I'm applying to a bunch of uh, internships. And so right now I'm looking for um, an internship role at some sort of sustainability, urban agriculture, green design related field, uh, because even though much of my work was focused around mental health the past few years, I think what I really learned from all of what I did was how to curate environments that allow people to optimize their well-being. And what I care about is the, the physical and like emotional design of spaces that make people feel their best. And that's and that and I think having helping people feel their best is related to sustainability because you know you want to feel your best in order to live a long life, a long, healthy life. And so all of these are ideas are basically resulting in me seeking out this this new job in this new field and back to your question about the personal goal I think I'm just I'm trying to find I'm trying to be increasingly okay with this new uncertainty that's entered my life because I'm going through such a career pivot um yeah <laughs> and also I think practice being myself in social scenarios because I think I'm 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 good about being authentic and super comfortable with people that I'm already close with or if I have a chance to talk to someone new in a one-on-one -on -one setting however you know in school in New York you're often you often catch yourself like being in a group setting with people you don't know and whatever and I kind of want to learn how to navigate the small talk because I hate small talk but also like learn to learn to have, I don't know, just, just learn to interact with, with new people and like be fully myself and not worry about what they're thinking, I guess. Well, thank you very much for that elaboration, Anastasia. And before we go into some of the topics that you mentioned as your passions or as your goals for the upcoming terms, I would be super interested in this career pivot or in this rethinking. Is that something that you have a process for challenging ideas or challenging the track that you are on? Or when did that decision was made? Yeah, I think, honestly, when I reflect, I realize that repeatedly throughout my life, I've, I've reached points where I thought I was plateauing either professionally or personally or intellectually. And I always wanted to challenge myself to discover something new or attain a new level of, of whatever it is that I wanted to. Because like I said before, I love learning so much. And I find that it that that learning adds a lot of 
excitement to my life because I can see myself progressing by absorbing this new information and eventually hopefully regurgitating it somewhere or like putting it to use for some sort of creative um, or like social impact oriented purpose. And I, I think I, I took a step back regarding the mental health work that I did a few months ago, because I realized that I had reached a point of burnout in regards to my personal storytelling. So since I was around 16 years old, I have been telling my personal mental illness story about my experience with binge eating disorder um, and also anxiety, social and generalized anxiety disorder and all of that. And I've been sharing that story publicly uh, through webinars, through news channels, different podcast interviews. And at the time, it was really interesting and fun for me. And, you know, it's not like a tip, something typical that a high school student gets to do. And so the excitement of all of it kept me going and kept me motivated. And I saw that it was actually positively impacting people in some way because I had other young people reaching out to me saying their story had um, hit really close to home or had inspired them to be more open about their struggles or even seek therapy and all of that. But I found myself in this position that I, that I didn't feel I was qualified to be in, which is to provide mental health advice to other teenagers when I myself was 16, 17 year old, still navigating life. I mean, as everyone is at every stage of life, but you know, especially during that time. Um, and I hadn't fully recovered from my eating disorder at that time. And I hadn't fully figured out how to manage my anxiety uh, to a level where it can actually help me, kind of like what Dr. Tracy talked about in, the, in one of the previous episodes. Um, and so all of these people were reaching out to me and like asking me to make these grand statements about like the, the, the state of mental health of Generation Z or like, how can, how can you help me with my personal anxiety or what should I do in this scenario? And like all of these, these questions that I just didn't feel like I was fit to answer um, because at the end of the day, like, I don't know what's going to work for someone. I'm not a trained like clinical psychologist or whatever. And also everyone is so individual and unique. And I don't want to be giving the wrong piece of advice that could ultimately hurt someone. And I also don't want to be speaking, which is like funny that I'm saying this because I literally was, you know, filmed a documentary all about Gen Z and mental health. Um, and they asked me questions like this, but even then I felt a little bit uncomfortable answering, um, like, tell me about the state of mental health among Gen Z people and all of that. Because again, Gen Z is like millions and billions of people. And I'm just one of those people. And I just happened through luck and also hard work and um, all of this other stuff, like self-motivation. I happened to be that one person that was sought out for opportunities like podcasting and, and making a documentary and being featured on a podcast or a webinar. You know what I mean? Like, but that doesn't mean that I am the go-to person with all of the answers and all of the information. And it also got to a point where I realized I was digging internally um, to do this work, which is great because I think it um, allowed me to engage in a lot of self-reflection, which is really important, I think has made me my own best friend and all of that and has helped a lot in therapy. But ultimately, I think it's really important, especially at this age, to also learn about the world around you and how like the systems around you work and focus more on the external stuff as well, because I don't want to just be relying on my own personal experience to make a change in the world. I actually want to learn about like urban infrastructure and how we can make it sustainable and like all of this other stuff that requires me to learn new skills that I might not have had or to learn about how people interact in other places where I'm not from and all of that stuff because I think like in order to be a true like change maker or a contributor to gr the greater well-being you have to both be in touch internally but also externally hopefully this is all making sense <laughs> so that's kind of why I decided to to seek this this career pivot and also like I have a lot of different I have a lot of different hobbies and a lot of different interests in regards to like books and reading and watching documentaries and I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could transform those hobbies into actual um, like professional pursuits so 
here I am. <laughs> and I definitely can tell you that this positive impact is already felt and there is a lot of different routes to take. And I think it's going to be very interesting and yeah, exciting to see which of those you're actually going for. And maybe we can use that as a little segue because also in our pre-talk, we talked about minimalism and uh, a curated life. And if you look for the definition, Curating is defined as to be in charge of selecting and caring for something. So can you maybe tell us what you understand a curated life is for yourself? Yeah, I've been thinking about this uh, topic of like life curation a lot these past few months. And to me, it means being really intentional about the people that you let into your life, about the physical environments you allow yourself to inhabit, um, and also digital and emotional environments as well. And just being super selective about what you divert your energy towards, I think, because I think a lot of times, especially when someone isn't necessarily super aware of who they really are or very internally connected to themselves they forget that they have this energetic aura that welcomes certain things and repels other things and I feel like the quote-unquote key to life is to become super aware of that energetic aura and develop this intentionality and mindfulness so that you welcome the things you truly want into your life and repel the things you truly don't want otherwise you're kind of letting the energetic or like take its own course and just kind of do whatever and I think that's what often results in you know maybe toxic relationships or unhealthy work environments or just situations that you typically don't feel your best in mm, absolutely and I believe it also has to do or you have to play a lot of honesty with yourself, but also with other people, right? So you have to self-reflect, as you said, you did earlier, or you do regularly, and then be really honest with yourself. What is the activities, the people, the places, the environments, really, that you want to yeah, be in or hang out with? I actually have a quote here that I take from the Forbes magazine, and it is a, on, from an article which is called A Framework for Living the Curated Life. And I quote, the decision to live a curated life isn't a decision to be made lightly. In fact, the trade-offs have the potential to make you antisocial, out of touch, and operating outside the day-to-day -day norms that make you a social creature. The decision to be tuned out, digitally quiet, or simply off the grid won't come without some complicated trade-offs. And I wonder if you have some examples of activities, things, or people that for you created complicated trade-offs. So letting go of something, I think is the right way to do so, but it's not easy sometimes. I think we talked about social media. This could be one example, but maybe you have others that we could yeah, talk about a little bit. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind is friendships. I used to, <laughs> so in middle and high school, like my, my close friends used to joke that I was the dropper. Like that was my little nickname because I was almost like notorious for being quick to cut off friendships when I recognized they're not good for me, which, you know, you would think is a good skill to have because I think a lot of times I saw this from my, my friends' friendships and also like family relationships and all of that when um, two people were in some sort of relationship, not romantic, or just like friendship almost. Um, and, but it was, it was totally toxic, but they went on and on with it for years because maybe they'd known each other for a while, or maybe they just got used to it and it's comfortable, even though it's unhealthy, you know, whatever. And it resulted, it, it didn't result in anything great. And, you know, both people were exhausted, resented their so, themselves, uh, or sorry, resented each other and probably themselves, who knows. <laughs> um, and there were just a lot more cons than pros <laughs> that came out of that. And so I thought, you know what, like, I know what it is that I want in a friendship. I know what it is that I want a friend to bring out in me. And I know what it is that I want to learn from other people. So why not just surround myself with the people that will lift me up and that I can truly learn positive things from instead of wasting my time and energy on a relationship that 
is only taking away from me, you know, and taking away from my energy and from my light. And I don't think that necessarily makes you like, like in that Forbes quote, it was talking about how it might make you seem like antisocial or kind of out of the loop or all that stuff. I don't think that's true because if you think about it, like there's no reality, like everyone lives in their own little worlds, whether you're removed digitally or not you know even people who are on social media and seem to be with it and with the cultural trends and like aware of the news that's definitely really biased and like (laughs) skewed especially on social media like everyone lives in their own version of reality and so I'm just living in a different version you know even though I'm like it, it do you know what I mean like it's Yeah, I just think that everyone lives in their own version of reality. And so by removing myself from certain situation, I'm still living in reality, but my own version of it, but that doesn't really matter because everyone lives in their own separate version of reality that's slightly different from the next person's. And also I think the common misconception about like deleting social media, for example, or spending less time on technology is that you're not aware of current events and you're not aware of like what's going on in the world and everything. I mean, I, I still, I read the news every single day. It's just, I limit it to maybe 15 minutes or something, or maybe I select three articles from three different news sources. And like, that's what I allow myself to consume that day, just because I know I'm aware of my capacity for certain types of information. And I know that if I continue reading news nonstop for hours and hours throughout the day, my body is going to feel overwhelmed. It's going to feel anxious. It's going to feel distracted from my work. And that's not going to benefit anyone because every single person in my life in that case will receive a more anxious, stressed and distracted version of me. And I don't think that's fair to them. Like one of the things that I've been telling, uh, talking to my friends about a lot recently is I realized that taking care of my own mental health is not only good for me, but it's also good for the people that I love in my life, because that way I can show up as my highest version, my most energetic, present, uh, empathetic version to them. And I think that's important because I really like taking care of the people that I care about. Yeah. And so to answer your question, I've, I've like removed myself, I guess, from relationships like that. Uh, what else? I think I'm trying to think, I guess also like work environments are another thing that I'm, I'm really picky about, which is, has been actually really interesting as I'm going through this internship application process, because I have a very specific vision of what I want my work environment to embody but you know it can be difficult to find especially in an entry-level position and that's why I think starting my own business was so appealing to me and still is very appealing to me because I can kind of dictate those elements myself so I can build what it is that I want However, I I think there's like this like spiritual hippy dippy part of myself that's like, hey, like if you know what you want in your head and and you're working towards it and you're giving off that energy, like it'll come to you, you know, and like don't be so selective and so picky that you neglect even applying somewhere just because it doesn't match one of your like work life balance criteria, you know, because I truly believe also that you should take on an opportunity and kind of not think too much about how you're going to figure it all out and just let it happen. Let, let, let the schedule become a schedule and let the tasks be given to you. And then you figure out how to like navigate everything and balance it with all of your other responsibilities. Like I think planning is great to an extent, like before it reaches the super anxious phase, you know? Yeah. And then you kind of come and take it as it goes and adjust based on that. And when you're talking about work environments and when you're also talking about friendships and letting go, I would be very interested in how do you take those decisions? Do they just come and you realize, okay, this job might not be for me or I don't want to hang out with this person anymore? Do you keep track? Do you have a list? Do you have any kind of yeah supporting data that you keep for yourself? How do you take decisions? Definitely don't have an Excel spreadsheet for, <laughs> for friendships or anything. Honestly, it... A lot of it, especially when it comes to the more, like in my head, I think of relationships as like a, I almost relate to like a soft skill, you know, it's like a softer, more emotional thing. And so when it comes to making decisions in those like softer realms, I leave it up more to my intuition and how I feel inside. Um, 
because I feel like I've gotten to a point where I'm very much in tune with myself and what I like, what I don't like, what I want, what I don't want. And so when it comes to relationships, that's, I let my intuition basically dictate that. And, you know, I can't really describe intuition as anything more than a feeling, (laughs) you know, you just kind of get it or you don't. Um, And then for work related decisions, I definitely am a little bit more like analytical and objective about it. I like to weigh the, the, the pros and cons. I also like to evaluate how will this work opportunity fit into the grand scheme of my career plans. And I'm not someone who necessarily has a step-by-step like 10-year plan, like climbing the corporate ladder or anything, because I very much want to work on different creative projects throughout my life and make several career pivots because I enjoy that risk-taking and I enjoy learning and the uncertainty that comes with all of that. And I definitely take into consideration the the people in those work environments, for example, like the people who are hiring me and the current employees and how would I fit into their culture? And do I like them as people and human beings? Because I think that the way that people, like people's interpersonal skills and the way they interact with other people and the way they make other people feel, I think is very reflective of the values that led them to a specific job. And so I basically take a step back and evaluate whether all of that seems to be a good fit for what it is that I want to do and what my values are and who I want to grow into. Um, and then if, if so, then like, yeah, it's a go, you know, and I'll try to get that job or, or whatever. And if not, then I just think, you know what, this door is closing, but 10 others are opening up somewhere else. And something that I always keep in mind is I view like the world, especially like work stuff as this big pie and and in my head I think that there's an infinite number of slices of pie for everyone so even if like someone gets that job that you might not have gotten that pie slice is gone but another one grows into its place or is like baked into its place you know so there's an infinite supply of opportunity for everyone and so I don't really get discouraged if I don't if I'm not accepted to something or invited to something because I always know that there's something bigger, greater, and more fulfilling opening up for me elsewhere. And I just have to keep going. Like, I think, I think I just really value like consistency and because consistency in terms of like work, work ethic and always working towards something because hard work is bound to pay off. If you, if you keep yourself motivated and you keep yourself focused and all of that, you know, through failure and everything, you will ultimately reach success at some point, whether it's five months later or like five years later, but it'll happen. And I'm in it for the long-term game. So. Absolutely. And you don't really know when it's going to happen. And I think that's also a beauty of it. And as long as you go forward, I think that's exactly the right direction. So thank you very much for that elaboration. Anastasia, before that, we were talking a little bit about minimalism or a curated life. And I think you already mentioned quite a few benefits for yourself and how you make use of them. But if we would ask, why is minimalism not only good for individuals, but why is minimalism also good for a society? What would you say? Mm. I want to clarify something before I go on and talk about minimalism, because I am not someone who owns five items and (laughs) I'm like, that's it, I'm set. I actually... If you look at my Pinterest board at some of my interior design Pinterest boards, you might even say I'm a bit of a maximalist, but it really, I guess, depends on (laughs) that day's taste. Um, However, I think I'm minimalistic in terms of what makes me truly happy and fulfilled. And by that, I mean, I I know that physical items will never make me the happiest version of myself. I know that achieving a certain career level will never make me ultimately happy. I know, however, that the few, a few things such as relationships and my physical health and my mental health um, and some experiences are the things that will make me happy. So there's like a, a small like quantity of things that I know will give me true joy in my life. And I think in that way, I'm a minimalist. So I'm not looking like, I don't think I'm very high maintenance when it comes to happiness. <laughs> you know what I mean? I kind of know the core basic things that you don't need to spend any money on. You don't need to like physically like 
ob obtain them in any way, but you just kind of know they're there. And, and, and those are the things that add real value to life. Your, your second question was how it is good for society, good for society. I mean, I think minimalism just provides so much mental clarity. And I think everyone can use a little bit of mental clarity and calmness in their life because that impacts the way that they interact with people and the decisions that they make and the projects they choose to pursue. Because I think a lot of times, especially right now, a lot of people are seeking so many things and think they need to achieve so many certain so many things and and purchase so many things and do so many things in order to be this highest most successful version of themselves this themselves and in turn i think they experience a lot of disappointment and disappointment tends to make people you know not so happy or maybe even jealous or resentful of others and that only fosters more like hatred and 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 unhappiness and negativity in the world and i feel like we can all agree that we only need less of that and so i think that the more minimalistic people are i think the happier people can be and the more helpful towards one another and the less competitive um and i think that can that can make a lot that that can make societies a lot more peaceful and collaborative rather than 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 competitive. And I was just wondering when you talked if this is something that happened to you personally as well that you were setting out for something and then you got it and then you realized fairly quick that the next thing is always on the horizon and that you just keep on running. I don't know if something comes to mind. I think so when I was doing a lot of my mental health public speaking stuff I want to say like a year and a half ago or something like at the height of that I was doing a lot of interviews with different news channels and I was featured in some articles of some like rather prominent like magazines and all of that and at the time it definitely was cool you know it was like whoa like this is sick but then that feeling lasted for maybe five seconds. And I was like, oh, okay. Like my life hasn't really changed that much, you know? And I also think I got to a point where a lot of people were telling me I was doing a good job and that I'm doing amazing work. And I started to realize that at, at, the, at one point it got to this place where I no longer felt anything when people told me that. And I no longer even wanted to hear how well I was doing because it simply didn't make a difference in who I was. It didn't help me evolve in any way. It didn't help me improve how I treated other people or helped other people achieve things, you know, and it didn't result in, in any self growth, I guess, is the is the point I'm trying to make. So all of this praise and clapping and all of that, like it just didn't it didn't mean much anymore because it didn't change me as a person. I think what really changes me as a person is like constructive criticism or like feedback on a project that I made and, and that feeling of, okay, I'm evolving um, my skills and maybe like my own personal characteristics and I'm doing a good job or not a good job, but I'm, I'm improving on this project that I've set out to execute and all of that. And those are the things that make a difference in my life. Not so much um, all of these, all of these other like meaningless accolades, you know? And I think you raise a ton of beautiful, wonderful points. And one thing that you talked about earlier is this physical, mental, and digital environments. Maybe this is something that we can look into a little bit. And my first question would be, you've mentioned a little bit of the projects that you're working on, but why are design and mental health are so closely related? Oh. Okay, this is a great question for you to ask me because my concentration at my university is kind of focused around this. And so I'm going to have to eventually explain it to professors later on and like justify why it is like that I'm studying all this stuff and like why it makes sense. So I think design, specifically good design, it's focused on building objects, 
places and you know all these other things that are meant to be functional and to add uh, ease to someone's life or to add a little bit of joy or perhaps inspiration to someone's life. And I think there are similar themes in the realm of mental health, right? Like mental health is this pursuit of wellness and happiness and ability to navigate challenging times. And I think there's a lot of overlap between design and, and mental health because it's always, I think both things are the pursuit of something that feels good or that looks good or that is overall of good quality basically and I can really hope that makes sense in other people's head and not just mine because to me it's like so clear and evident <laughs> but I, I I don't know if I'm like articulating it super effectively so let me know if I should if I should describe it better so basically I understand that you say okay for design and also for mental health is basically the pursuit of the good or something that may feel good or that you create an environment with design or that you create a design that helps your mental health because it feels comforting, because it feels good, because you feel comfortable, because you feel fine with that. And then your mental health is going up with that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think on a much more like objective physical level design, for example, like the design of, of infrastructure and, and like roads and buildings and all of that is actually pretty evidently tied to mental health because the structure of a city um, can or cannot be conducive to one's well-being because it can uh, encourage people to be more physically active by dis building more sidewalks, for example, or making cities much more pedestrian-centric rather than car-centric. And that in turn makes people a lot more active and um, increases the chance that they'll bump into someone and maybe start a conversation. And so it encourages more socialization, which can boost your mental well-being and make you feel more connected to your community. And so I think these really basic things like buildings and roads and, and parks are actually super obviously tied to the well-being of an individual and to the mental well-being of an individual. I wrote multiple papers my high school year and my, my freshman year at college all about how urban green spaces impact their visitors' mental health. And I basically analyzed Domino Park in Brooklyn and also the High Line in Manhattan. And I took a look at all of these different elements that they had, such as the different artistic sculptures that were um, installed in the parks and how like the colors and the actual shapes can impact how people feel and how like the color red uh, can make someone feel like anger or something like that. Whereas this other color could make someone feel calm. So just by looking at that structure and also walking through this park that's covered in different types of uh, greenery and all this nature can make someone feel a lot calmer in cities that typically cause a lot of stress to their inhabitants. And so to me, it's just, it's all so interrelated. And I think what I'm more fa I'm, I'm fascinated more by the infrastructure of mental health rather than tackling mental illness once that's already like become uh, or tackling mental illness directly basically like I'm much more interested in how do we change the systems um, that exist today so that we can help people live better lives because right now I think the way that so many residential areas are designed they're designed to basically make people fail in terms of their health and their happiness. And I want to reinvent all of that and make it easier for people to live healthy, happy lives because it shouldn't be this difficult. You know, you shouldn't have to be going to therapy twice a week and getting on medication and all of this. Stuff. I mean, therapy is great, actually. I'm a huge proponent of therapy, but still, you know, it's a lot that our capitalistic systems are asking of or people to, to pay such large sums of money um, to obtain healthy food and to obtain um, like medical assistance and all of this stuff. Whereas if we just made cities have all of these elements naturally, like innately, then people would be much less focused on how do we fix what's what what has 
uh, what is wrong and much more focused on how do we just like make our community even better? How do we work on these like creative things or how do we do this and this? You know what I mean? Like, because I think so many people's lives nowadays are just consumed by fixing problems that are caused literally by the societies that we live in. And so if we just design better societies from the very beginning, people wouldn't have to focus and devote like 95% of their time and energy to all of that stuff and could instead focus on evolving themselves and, and being better uh, community members, you know? So how would you design such a society? What would be your ideal world? And you can choose to answer that on a micro level, like one district in New York, or you can choose to answer that on a macro level, like the whole population of Earth. But what are certain pillars that come to mind that you would change or that you would design differently for a society to be more humble, happy, functioning, whatever we want to call it? Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is actually the five pillars of the children's mental wellness subscription box business that I that I that I built last summer, um, which were hopefully I can remember them. <laughs> They were uh, sleep, relationships, movement, mindfulness, and challenge. And by challenge, that just means teaching them something new, you know, like a new skill that they can adopt um, and that could add something to something of value to their lives. And so I think those should be the five pillars of, of cities as well, right? And so for the movement aspect, definitely green spaces. I mean, the more greenery we have, not only is it better for the environment because it sequesters carbon, but also it's, it provides space for people to be physically active from maybe to exercise, do yoga, or just sit down and enjoy and relax and clear their mind from the busyness of their day. And green spaces are also a great place for gathering. And so that knocks out the relationship pillar as well, because then you can have picnics with people. You can have uh, just conversations while you're walking through. Um, I think also having like mixed use buildings where you have like residential areas at the top and then maybe storefronts or cafes and all of that at the bottom, which uh, a lot of neighborhoods in New York, specifically in the West Village uh, neighborhood exhibit, because then you've got the, the socialization part downstairs and you've got the, the practical living space upstairs. And there's opportunity for you to, again, perhaps bump into someone, start a new conversation and also develop a relationship with people who visit the cafes, you know, typically in coffee shops or whatever, you kind of get those regular visitors or you see the same um, baristas working there day to day. And so you begin to develop a relationship and trust among these people. And I think that's really important, especially for feeling as though you have a community and you have people that have your back. Other elements, I think, Oh, definitely having access to uh, fresh produce. So whether that be frequent farmers markets or just grocery stores that stock healthy food, because, oh my God, are the grocery stores in the US just totally mortifying <laughs> for someone that has any sort of knowledge about nutrition and what it does to your, your physical and mental well-being. I went to Spain for the first time this summer, and it was my first time really being in Europe. I mean, I was born in, in, in Russia, but I only ever like lived in that area and it's been a while since I've been back. And so when I went to Spain and I was visiting the grocery stores in the town that I was living in, I was like pleasantly surprised by how small and like compact they were and how fewer choices they had, which I think is honestly really helpful because I, I don't think having like 34 different flavors of super sugary cereal is like the best thing to have, you know? <laughs> and it just makes life a lot more simple, you know, when you know that you're being fed good things and that you don't really have to put so much effort into seeking out like what actually has clean ingredients and like not have all of these crazy like sugars and additives and all of that stuff because it impacts how you feel at the end of the day. And I, when I was filming for the documentary, we went to um, Baltimore. Yeah, it, it was Baltimore uh, into like, like inner city Baltimore too. So some neighborhoods that uh, were predominantly low income. And I noticed that there weren't any grocery stores in that area that supplied fresh produce. And I just thought of how 
oh my God, the systems we have built, like particularly in the US, really are designed to make people fail. Because how are these people who are low income supposed to find food that makes them feel better and give them the energy to perhaps uh, like keep going to school or keep doing their work or show up for the people in their lives um, and eventually like work their way up. You know, it's like, it's the cyclical thing where you're not giving them the things that they need in order to thrive. And then you're also bashing them for not thriving, but it's like, you're not, we're not helping them in any way. And so access to, to grocery stores and all of that. Um, yeah. And then I think also having, some sort of artistic centers, whether that be museums or movie theaters or something where people can go to for entertainment is also really important because we need things that can help us relax and, and just enjoy life, hang out with friends at. So yeah, all of those things. I think are, are important to have. Also make them, make them pedestrian centric. I mean, for God's sake, like remove the focus of cars and like stop building highways and all of that. I think that's pretty detrimental to our overall well-being. So, yeah. Which actually raises a curiosity question. How pedestrian or cycle centric is New York by now? It's been a few years that I've been and in Europe, it really varies depending on the city that you go to. Amsterdam, for example, is making in my opinion, very great steps towards not having cars anymore. They make it super expensive to park your car. They only have one ways. It's really not fun to drive a car in Amsterdam. Probably it's still going to take another, what, 10, 15 something years. But there's other cities like German cities or Polish cities or Spanish cities that I've been to. And then it's super car centric. How is that in New York? How many people are using cycle? You know, what I think is interesting about New York is like the people who drive cars think it's car centric. And so they'll just like prioritize. They, they think everyone with a car is the priority and that everyone else, like the bikers and, and the pedestrians can go like F themselves. And so they're super harsh <laughs> and like all of that. But then the cyclists, they think they're the center of the universe too. And so they'll also be weaving in and out of cars and like not letting pedestrians cross the road. And then pedestrians were kind of like, well, if we get hit, we get hit. Like I might as well still make a run for it, you know? So it's really chaotic. Um, but to answer your question, it's not that that pedestrian centric. I mean, there's a lot of people who walk and I think there's like a, this really nice culture of walking to places and like a 25, 30 minute walk feels like nothing in New York in comparison to like maybe a more of a suburban area where there's not much to look at or like not many sidewalks connecting to one another. Um, however, I think that there definitely needs to be more of an effort to make New York City less car centric, because also if you think about it, like you can use the subway, you can use a public transportation like the bus system, you can use bicycles and they're actually, I think, making a lot more bike lanes, I believe, because we also now have city bike and then we've got that lovely uh, bike route that goes all along Manhattan, uh, like along the Hudson River and everything. Um, and then there's the bike routes on the bridges going between um, Manhattan and Brooklyn. And so there is a lot of opportunity to be to, to move from one place to another without having to use a car. And honestly, I I Uber like very rarely, like I probably Uber like, I don't know, like four times a year or something. And and that's probably if I'm like moving a lot of stuff from one apartment to the other, you know, so yeah, I think it it really depends on also like the individual's lifestyle too, because obviously people who can't afford it probably do tend to Uber more often um, and those who can't don't. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Now that's interesting because I think New York is also one of the cities that is actually changing and changing art. And one would like to think that it's also getting more and more pedestrian centric and cycle centric. And probably if you look at it over time, it probably has done so. So I guess, I think we have, Two next topics that we could look into. One would be, we talked a little bit, or we talked quite a bit actually about those physical environments, and we could now check out mental environments and digital environments. I think this is one direction of our conversation that we could take. And another one, if we talk about all those um, physical environment components, it would be also very interesting for me or for the audience to talk with you about sustainability. I don't know if you have any preference where we should guide this conversation for now. Let's talk about 
digital environments. All right. So we've been talking now quite some time about physical environments and how a city could look like and what would be the benefit for society. And this is really the physical aspect of an environment. But as you know, as most of our audience knows, we do not only spend time in the physical environment, but we also spend a lot of time in digital environments. And I'm very sure that there is also yeah, certain things to create, certain things to design, certain certain things to take care of. I don't know if you have any opening thoughts on that. Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is actually, so when I was doing the NYU Startup Sprint earlier this summer, one of the things that my co-founder and I were doing were was interviewing college students about what they did during breaks, so breaks from studying or from working, um, and how they felt after those breaks. And what we learned from our research is that around 95% of the 50 students we interviewed said that they feel worse, less energetic, and less productive after they occupy a break with using their phone. So when they use social media or watch a YouTube video, they typically feel less productive and less focused when they return to doing work. Um, and also those breaks tend to run longer than they anticipated them to, because obviously social media is so is designed to be addictive. Um, so it's it's easier to to get sucked in. Um, and they all also reported that whenever they do a non screen activity during their break, such as go on a walk, grab a coffee, talk to a friend they feel way more energized afterwards and they're able to focus much better. And they also feel more positive and optimistic. So their overall mood improves afterwards. And that really got us thinking about um, how do we teach people to take high quality breaks? Because at the end of the day, high quality breaks are really the things that allow us to power through the day. Um, because especially over the past few years, I feel like, I mean, maybe not so much during the pandemic, but prior to then, there was this huge culture of work, grind, hustle 24-7, always be productive, like no sleep, sleep is for the week and all of that. But I think the pandemic has taught us, and also this greater focus on mental health, it's all taught us that there needs to be more of a work-life balance. And in order to do good work, we need to take good breaks. The issue is, is that phones are so easily accessible and they're just they're just easy go-tos when a break comes around, you know, like the idea of going for a walk seems a lot more daunting than just whipping out your phone and scrolling through like Twitter or something. And so, yeah, I just wanted to like mention that and see if honestly, any, any thoughts, if, if you have any thoughts that pop up um, on that and like, how do I know now I'm interviewing you, <laughs> but I'm actually really curious, like, what do you do during your breaks and have you noticed a difference? And I actually really do like to get questions back. So I really appreciate that. And yes, I do believe that there has been somewhat of a change through the pandemic. I think a lot of people actually realize that taking a walk, going outside, exposure to nature, I would just call it, or also sunlight exposure um, helps a lot. And that it's actually nicer to do something like that. Nevertheless, I also do believe that the easy way out or the easy way to take a break is still look at your phone or check something in your mail. And I mean, I would be lying if I wouldn't say that I also once in a while check my phone and stuff, but I have since ever, since I remember, I'm very happy that I'm still in the generation who knows how to live a life with and live a life without a smartphone. So I do not have notifications on my phone since years since or until I started with this podcast, I never really had social media. So for me, it was always normal and perfectly fine only speaking for myself to be in nature and to go outside. But then, as you said, right, I mean, I worked quite a bit as a management consulting myself. Strategy consulting is not really known for short days anyways. And then you sit on a train, you sit on a plane, and obviously you would just go on your phone and you check mail, to check whatever you can. And I actually tried to use that time, this extra time back then, a lot to cultivate my relationship. So this was really the time that I traveled, was the time that I sent messages, that I sent voice messages and so forth. But 
I think over the past few years, to answer your question a little bit better or more precise, I think some people have understood that nature and that not looking on a device is a much better break. But I also believe that at the stage where we are now, which I believe is fairly critical, it, are people going back to the office? Are people staying remote? And I think there is good reasons for and against both. But I think it's fairly critical because I believe a lot of people will also tend to forget fairly fast again how all that positive impact that we learned over the past few years yeah, made us feel better, made us more energetic, made us more happy. And I could imagine that we can also forget about that fairly fast. But I think this is, yeah, again, something, again, really personal. And I really, really believe it also depends on the bubble you're in. I mean, we all live in our bubbles, right? You called it reality earlier. We live our reality. It doesn't matter what other people live their reality. We live our reality and we live it within our bubbles. So we choose to be with people who are similar. So I would say for my bubble and my world, most people are very aware and are fairly sensitive of using digital means to break. But I'm very sure that there is a lot of people who never got to know about such things. And I'm very sure that there is people who can learn a lot of that, which is also one of the reasons why we have this conversation. So maybe one or 10 or 2,000 people hear about this message and quest start questioning a thing or two and then start changing their behavior towards what's better for them. Yeah, no, that's so well put. And uh, yeah, no, exactly. Because I think that taking charge of your digital environment helps you engage with your physical environment better too. Because when you become aware of of the often, but not always, but sometimes negative um, impact of being immersed in the digital world, you begin to appreciate the physical world a lot more. And you start to begin to notice those differences, right? Because there are some people, like you mentioned, that might be taking all of their breaks using social media or just being on their phone and like not even be aware of the fact that they could feel way better if they didn't do this stuff during their break and so only by raising awareness and then gradually implementing and trying out these practices yourself will you begin to kind of experiment and see oh when does my mood feel at its best when does it not and then based on that make changes in your lifestyle so I think that's totally valid and I think that's something that I always have to remind myself too because I've been in this mental health sphere for quite a few years and so I'm aware of like all of these little things that impacts my overall uh, well-being and mood and focus productivity levels whereas some people they just never had perhaps the privilege of being exposed to any of these practices or strategies. And so they have no idea because they've lived their life this one way and to them, that's their norm. And so they don't, they can't even imagine anything better. And I get that. And that's why we do podcasts like this. Um, just because I, I, if there's one thing that I would like someone to take away from this is to like be be open to experimenting on yourself and experimenting and trying on different lifestyles. That's kind of how I like to, uh, the mindset that I like to adopt whenever I'm trying to implement a new, a new skill or habit in my life is to try on these different hats, right. And like, see which one works for me and which one doesn't. And you got to like, remember to, I mean, I guess it's different because I'm also, I'm, I'm 19. So to me, life does feel, I guess, pretty long. Um, and so to me, I'm, I'm in no rush to get everything down perfectly right now. And so I'm aware that like, hey, if I tried this thing out for 30 days, perhaps like, you know, say I did have social media and I was trying to out a digital detox for 30 days in the grand scheme of things, 30 days is nothing, you know? So all that can really come from it is a learning experience and perhaps a new lifestyle adjustment. So yeah, just be open to trying out, trying out new things that could potentially improve the quality of your life. Absolutely. And also accepting that not all new things are for you, right? I mean, that is why we call it experimenting. So you try 12 things next year and out of those 12 things, maybe only eight for, are for you, or maybe only one thing is for you, or maybe you didn't even like any of those. Um, depends on the sample you take. And yeah, I think the only caveat I have for social media and digital and feeling more happy is the 
for me, at least what I experience is that there is a lot of people who actually believe that they are happy or they actually believe now those companies or many of those companies are actually fairly smart at making you think that you are happy. I mean, there is a lot of dopamine being set free and they have smart people to make people think, but exactly it, it loops back to what you said, just experiment and see what happens to your overall mental health, to your overall mood and to your overall physical health and so forth. So I really acknowledge you for experimenting. I think that's a wonderful thing to do. I do have two follow-up questions for this digital environments. And if we talk about digital environments and we say, okay, we would like to avoid them as good as possible because we want to have physical environments, the real interactions and so forth. But if we would want to create more healthy digital environments, is there something that comes to mind that you would also use here as a pillar or as a foundation to create such? Yeah, I think never check your phone first thing when you wake up or last thing before you go to bed. Um, so this is kind of like the tip or strategy that I always tell people when they say, I don't want to fully delete social media and all of that, but I do want to, you know, practice digital, digital wellness habits. And so I've talked to my mom about this, or I talked to my mom about this a few days ago, actually. And she has this habit of checking the news within five minutes of waking up because it's the first thing that's on her mind. And so I think it's important to practice that, uh, that, muscle of resisting that urge um or like resisting that addiction almost to know to know everything you know and to teach yourself to not seek short-term gratification all the time because social media you know really instills that into us is to always like want something instantly and so i think by flexing that muscle of resisting that urge is going to help like overall in life too, because, you know, not everything happens instantly. And I think it's, it's important for like work ethic and like working towards goals and all of that to be in it for the long-term game and not expect everything immediately. Um, so yeah, like not checking your phone specifically, not checking the news and social media, because that's a lot of information all at once within like the first five seconds of starting a new day and typically news aren't so great you know and so that can really put you in a negative or anxious state for the rest of the day and that can affect how you interact with people how you do your work uh, how much of your work you get done, how well you do your work um, and just how you feel about yourself the rest of the day and some other tips, let me think. Oh, I think a really like healthy practice is to always put your phone um, away where you can't see it when you're sitting down and talking to someone specifically like the scenario that I think of is I go out to coffee a lot of times with my friends and typically, I mean, during the school year, typically we're also like doing work, but sometimes we just go out for coffee just to chat and catch up. And during those situations, um, my close friends and I, we always put our phones away into our bags or into our pockets. Even having it face down on the table sometimes isn't the best because it's still there. It's still like, it's still a bit of a distraction. It's like a third person who's there, but isn't like speaking. You just like feel their presence, <laughs> but they're not really participating. Um, because then you get to actually like hear the person and what they have to say and be an active listener and not have your mind trail off and wonder about all of the 50 other million things that could possibly be happening or all of the 50 other people who could possibly be contacting you in that moment. And I think what happens is after like 30 minutes or something of talking to that person and being truly present during that time, you feel more connected to them and you feel as though, wow, we just we just bonded some more, my friend and I, you know, and you like feel yourself actively growing closer to them. And I think that's like a really beautiful, a beautiful feeling um, and something that can brighten, brighten your day, maybe even your week. And that feeling carries on with you for a much longer period of time than that dopamine, dopamine hit of just checking Instagram immediately, you know? So, so focus on the long-term uh, gratification rather than the short-term gratification and a fun story or a side story that I have shared like when I lived in Amsterdam it's been almost 
10 years and when we out went out for coffee or when we en- went out for drinks with like six eight ten people i actually started telling people okay let's put all our phones down and the first one who grabs their phone pays for the round and in the beginning everybody thinks it's a funny thing to do right for the first 10 15 20 minutes or it was like okay cool but you could really and that's 10 years ago almost you could really see how after 45 minutes, especially for those people who have some kind of lights on their phones, like blue is for Facebook, green is for WhatsApp, red is for whatever. You could really see how they get nervous or they get anxious and they couldn't stand it anymore. And for me, it was always like free drinks, first of all, but also interesting to understand yeah, that not each and everybody does want to be present with you, right? If I would go out with a friend, with a family member, with somebody I care about, because only then I would go out with this very particular person for coffee, for lunch, for drinks, whatsoever, I would want to be present with that person, right? But I think there is a lot of people, and I don't think it has changed for the better much over the past 10 years that really do not experience that presence often. So I sign that 100% that you said, like, put your phones away and focus on the person that you are in the room or in the cafe or in the restaurant with. And if it gets boring after five minutes, well, then maybe you question yourselves friendships towards each other and maybe find other people playing out with. I think I'm fairly blunt and honest and direct there as well. So well put. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that being present offers a moment of or an opportunity to self-reflect on relationships, especially. Yeah. Because if you're bored with those people, then why are you spending time with them? You know, there's no point. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Anastasia, this might be a dead end and this might be another hour of a conversation, but if we talk about digital environments, I don't know if you have any thoughts or ideas on the metaverse i think it's just something that yeah comes to my mind if we talk about digital environments i don't know if you have any yeah thoughts on that yeah that's interesting you bring that up because a few months ago i went to this gathering of sorts all about web3 and what that means for edtech And I thought it was really interesting because it was talking about how we can build all of these digital environments uh, in the metaverse for kids to learn about certain things, um, especially in terms of like emotional well-being. And we can simulate certain interactions so that kids can learn how to um, maybe treat a friend when they're down or how to um help someone need of a certain something or whatever and I just thought god that's like a little bit disturbing (laughs) to me because the more time that they spend in these like virtual realms obviously the less they'll be spending in real life and I think there's a big danger to that because I think especially when you're a kid I think it's really important to be a lot more hands-on with things like literally physically playing with toys or physically building, I don't know, little structures out of Lego or learning how to make things with your hands and also learning how to speak to children in real life and how to maybe make spontaneous friendships on the playground or something because they teach you lifelong skills. And I think that they teach you that the real world is really interesting and they teach you to be a little bit more innovative and rely and and self-sufficient in that you rely on yourself to be a source of entertainment um, and excitement rather than something else, something external to entertain you. And I think that that confidence and belief that, you know what, even if I was left alone with nothing, I could still make my own fun somehow. I think that's a really important important belief to have to carry you forward because it makes you feel less alone it makes you feel a lot more confident in yourself and when we're constantly relying on these other external sources of information of education whatever it just it can be difficult because I think it makes you grow farther away or further away from yourself and who it is that you are and so I don't know I'm like a little bit iffy about it because I get that like perhaps um the metaverse stuff and like virtual headset things can make um, certain opportunities accessible to people that might not have access to things. For example, like, um, oh, they actually, 
that was, this is interesting. So in the presentation at that ed tech gathering thing, the woman was talking about how um, not all kids, for example, can afford to go on a trip to Alaska, right? Whereas like some schools, perhaps like private schools will take their their students on a trip to Alaska for whatever reason. And so instead, these kids who are lower income and, and go to and go to public schools can use these virtual headsets to virtually go on a trip to Alaska. And it sounds great, I guess. But in my head, I'm like, you guys, you're totally ruining the experience for these kids. Because in a way, I think you're subconsciously teaching them that oh, you're not good enough to get the actual experience. So you'll just have to settle for their for this lesser experience. And also you're not going to derive all of the same um, like learning experiences um, or, or the same uh, fulfillment from visiting a location virtually when you're physically still in that same spot that you've always been in than when you eventually end up going to that place or you know like I just think money can be invested in in other areas like other than the metaverse and that can truly help and transform people's lives especially little kids lives so yeah I'm like not the biggest not the biggest fan <laughs> of the metaverse stuff no I can hear that and yeah I also very vividly remember my emotions when I listened to the podcast of Tim Ferriss and Mark Zuckerberg, where they talked about the metaverse. And obviously, I've done some research about it before, and I've done some research about it afterwards. And I think it's an interesting place to know a thing or two about. But I think we share a feeling on the metaverse. And what you just described is, I think this is one of the reasons that metaverse supporter is always put forth right it's like the x is for each and everybody and when you describe that with going from a to b something that came to mind is also okay we have an open market then for work from all over the world so each and everybody can access but it also triggered another thought and when i was young my dad asked me whether or not i would like to be able to teleport myself to other places and i really like experiencing different cultures i really like seeing different places but from a very young age, I told him that I really would not like to be able to, because I think once you're able to teleport yourself into the metaverse or into real Australia or into real Alaska, it takes away that happiness and that curiosity, right? That you get or that you gain from maybe also looking forward to it, working to do a trip or just experiencing, yeah, the pure, real beauty of nature. So yeah, I... Exactly. Would agree on that as well. I think also just a quick point that I wanted to make too is the thought of that reminds me of like using Instagram, for instance, and how a lot of people say that they feel their worst after they exit the app after and after having used it for like longer than they wanted to. It's only when they close the app do they experience those negative feelings of, oh, I wasted my time. Why did I do that? I feel a little bit tired now, all of that. And I think the same thing would happen with these metaverse situations, especially when you're wearing those headsets and you're still sitting in like the same chair you would sit in doing any other work, but all of a sudden you're now in like, I don't know, France or something. And maybe for that hour, it is really interesting and it's cool. And you might even begin to trick yourself into believing, oh my gosh, I'm actually here. But as soon as you take those headsets off or that headset off, you're hit with the fact that you actually haven't gone to France. You're still sitting in a chair and you've just been sitting there for an hour pretending as though you've seen this place, as though you've witnessed this uh, transformational travel experience, when in reality you haven't. And I, and I fear that these same feelings of negativity, of, of worthlessness, of time wasting, are going to accompany these metaverse um, experiences the same way that like they do um, to Insta Instagram use. Mm, absolutely. And what then becomes reality, right? If you spend an hour a day in metaverse or an hour a day on Instagram, that's one thing. If you spend 10 or 12 or 15 or 16 or 18 hours or plus in the metaverse, then maybe you even start questioning what is reality. And I think the metaverse can be, if misused, the ultimate escape mechanism and that you escape reality, which I believe is not the best way forward, but that's my humble 
view on things. Anastasia, we have so many great topics. We have talked about some of them already. I think we have so many more for around two, round three, if we want. But I actually have a few questions, three of them, that I ask each and every of my podcast guests. But before we go there, I'm sure that people are inspired and want to reach out and potentially want to engage with you. Where can people find you? Where can people find the work that you're doing? I'm going to make sure to link all the notes that you sent me beforehand, our conversation as well. We didn't talk about all of them in detail, but yeah, where can people reach out and what's your means of communication? Sure. Well, given that I'm not on social media, I'm not going to plug any, any of my social media accounts, but I am on LinkedIn and I can, I don't even know what is a LinkedIn username. Is it just my name or is it the, I suppose it is. And I will make sure to link it. Yeah. It's just, I mean, if you just search up, if you just search up Anastasia Vlasova and then I'm the one that says I'm studying sustainability and design at NYU. So <laughs> you'll know that's me. And then Email if you, yeah, you can email me at Anastasia Vlasova at nyu.edu. So those are my two means of communication. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that brings me to the first of the three last ish, I want to call them questions because we never know where they will take us. But the first one would be Anastasia, what influenced and motivated you over the past week? Honestly, probably my yoga classes that I've done the past couple of days. Um, yesterday, I was doing a yoga sculpt class and my instructor finished the session off with doing a little bit of breath work. And she said, okay, now dedicate this next breath to someone in this room. Um, and I dedicated it to this woman named, named Nicole that I had just met in that class. We had introduced her, um, e each other uh, or we introduced ourselves to each other for the first time in that class. And I had just met her and for some reason, just dedicating that breath to this new person that had entered my life felt like a really beautiful thing to do. And I'd never done it before. And so I think that inspired me to just continue caring about the people that are in my, that are in my life, whether I've known them for years or whether I just met them and be really caring and kind towards towards people in general um, and do things with other people in mind more. I think for a while I have been very individualistic and focused on myself, which I think is super beneficial in many ways, but I also think I'm in a place now where I have the capacity to welcome more people into my life and focus on other people more in my day-to-day -day activities. And so I think from now on, I've been, or from, from that yoga session onwards, I've been inspired to, to do things with people in mind <laughs> more so than I've done in the past. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, I really like this collectivistic approach and allowing interesting people into your life. I think that's a good way forward. Thank you so much. And the second question would be, who are your mentors and whom do you look up to? Mm. Okay. I think actually someone asked me this on another podcast. I forget what I said. So I'll try to just, just think it off the top of my head now. Um, well, one of them definitely has been Adriana uh, Laterni. So she's the founder and CEO of Visura, which is a photojournalism uh, company. And she's actually one of my advisors for that startup that I was working on. And also just like a professional career mentor um, in general. And she's been helping me work on the speech that I'll be presenting later this October, all about digital wellness and creativity, actually. And she is just, she's got the best energy and she is so kind and so generous with her time and her advice. And yeah, she just inspires me in every way. And she's also very like artistically inclined to, I just like her vibe, her energy. It's great. <laughs> and it, it supports me a lot through the, prof the professional pursuits that I have. Another mentor of mine, I think is, hmm, 
they've changed a lot over the past few months. I would say my mom, at the end of the day, my mom has always inspired me to be, to stay true to myself and to pursue the things that I truly want in life and not focus so much on, you know, just getting a job that will make me money or just getting me a job that will uh, guarantee my stability and all of that. She's always pushed me to challenge myself to do things that I want, but make me scared and to embrace that, that fear and to embrace that challenge and to be okay with, with, with the fact that I'm a risk taker and the fact that I want to live an interesting, exciting life and do things that are a little bit unconventional because, you know, the thought of that is a little bit scary and like a lot of uncertainty comes with it, but she's always pushed me to continue doing it because at the end of the day, that's what's going to, or at the end of my life, that's what's going to make me feel happy when I reflect so yeah, my mom and Adriana, they're awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Sounds very nice. And yeah, as you describe it, I believe challenge and challenge being challenged is an integral part of a happy life. So it's good to have a challenging person or even a challenge on at work. So thank you so much for that. And that leads us to the third and final question. And it's rather hypothetical. And I call it the three foods. And I would like you to imagine that you are traveling all by yourself in space. And in fact, you're traveling for quite some time, a few months or even a few years. And after all that solo travel, you encounter a human-like species and they can only process three facts or three truths about humanity before they decide whether or not they want to get to know us. What do you tell them? Whoa, <laughs> that is like the craziest question I've been asked. Um, the thought of traveling alone in space kind of makes me a little bit like nervous because I love buildings and the fact that there's just no buildings up there. <laughs> um, okay. Three truths about humanity. Again, you're asking me one of those questions that I just don't feel like I'm like qualified to, to say, because I'm just one little tiny person out of so many people. Um, Honestly, okay, one of the things I got to say is probably most of us don't really know who we are as people. Like, I feel like that's a really true thing, as in a lot of people, even those that have lived for like, you know, 80, 90, even 100 years sometimes don't know who they are at the core. Another one. Do they all have to be like philosophical and profound not at all okay, they can okay. be whatever comes to mind okay I think we love to be performative like sometimes I think about how we've just designed this game of life and we all just abide by it just because that's what we're used to like for centuries and centuries and I think it's just interesting and a little bit funny to think about how different life could be if we simply designed it differently you know if we decided that like working a nine to five or even having a job that pays what we call money and what we assign worth to like what if that just wasn't a thing at all you know and so by by me saying we like to be performative um or we are performative I just mean that we like to assign roles and order to things in order to make ourselves feel as though we have like a sense of purpose um, and that there's some sort of organization in our lives. So, and then third thing. We could really use some more people or things in our lives that just help us feel more at ease and like let us let us help us let loose and relax like I think a lot of people could benefit from laughing a bit more and from just not taking things so seriously like even me too like sometimes I think about like if I'm getting really worked up about something I'm like why do I even care so much you know at the end of the day and I know that's like like one of those like controversial existential like things about like oh you should care you know like what does I don't care really mean but um at the end of the day, like it, it, like life really is a freaking game and we take things so seriously sometimes. And I think that if those little alien or like human resembling people could add a little bit more humor to our lives and help us 
live a little bit more at peace and at ease, then we would really benefit from that. 100% agreed. Thank you so much for that, Anastasia. And yeah, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. And if you have any final comments or remarks for our audience, now is the time. I actually, I, I remember that this has been in the back of my head since the beginning of this conversation. Um, when you asked me about my personal goals, I forgot to mention that one of my personal goals is also to to, to practice illustrating more. And so I've been dedicating a lot of my time these past few months to just making a bunch of illustrations, whether, whether I think they're good or bad, but simply just devoting time every week to expressing myself creatively through illustration. That's really a goal of mine as well. So I don't know if that'll make it in or not. It's fine if it doesn't. <laughs> and I just forgot to mention it earlier. Absolutely. Creative experimentation. I love it. Anastasia, thank you so much for being a guest on the Just Another Mindset podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. If you enjoy and learn from the Just Another Mindset podcast, please make sure to share this episode with a friend or two and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. And if you want to receive a brief overview of what made me think over the past week and join like-minded individuals, you may want to sign up to my weekly newsletter. It is easy to sign up. It is super easy to unsubscribe again. You will get information on the newest podcast episode and you will also get an overview of the content, books and podcasts mainly that I am consuming and I evaluate what I've learned over the past week. You will also get your weekly dose of optimism because you will receive the smile news with seven things that went right this week. And finally, you will get access to all my speaker notes that you can use to follow exercises and answer questions discussed in the podcast. Just follow the link in my bio to sign up for my newsletter and I'm already excited to see you on the other side. If there is any future topic or guest that you would like to hear more about on the Just Another Mindset podcast, please let me know by leaving a comment on YouTube or sending a mail directly to contact at ishmaelwondergarten.com. And if nobody told you lately, be reminded that you are worthy, you matter, and you can achieve anything. Just another mindset.